Seeing that it is one o'clock, I will call the March 18th uh, tax meeting to order. Um, Ms. Driska, first order of business, could you take the roll, please? Liz Lagarde. Present. David. David's present. David's present. Abadji. Present. Abadji, present. Carlson. Carlson, present. Carlson present. Detmer. Detmer present. Detmer present. Garofalo. Garofalo. Gomez. How about Garofalo present now? Now do you hear me? Yep. Now I hear you. Garofalo present. Gomez. Right. Gomez present. Gomez present. Her. Her present. Her present. Her toss. Her toss present. Her toss present. Howard. Howard. McDonald. McDonald. Miller. Miller present. Miller present. Moran. Present. Moran present. Mortensen. Present. Mortensen present. Robbins. Present. Robbins present. Sandell. Sandell. Schultz. Present. Schultz present. Stevenson. Present. Stevenson present. Swazinski. Present. Swazinski present. Joachim. Present. Joachim present. Howard. Present. Howard present. McDonald. Sundell, we have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Griska. Uh, I, I want to note that all the committee documents for today have been uh, sent to members and are on the committee page on the House website. The first order uh, is to approve the minutes from March 17th. Uh, Rep uh, Representative Akeem, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Yes, I have met Mr. Chair and I move the minutes for March 17th. Okay, does anyone have any questions uh, regarding the minutes? Seeing none, we will move to a vote. Uh, please everyone unmute for a brief moment. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries. Okay, um, the first we have up, uh, Representative Akeem, do you wish to move your bill? Um, I will move uh, House File 1801 of Representative Murphy's before the committee. Okay. Representative Murphy, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm very pleased to be here today with the citizens of Proctor to um, ask for an exemption from sales tax on the uh, sand and um, salt shed that they are going to be building starting in August and completing in uh, the beginning of 2022. And the mayor is here, uh, Chad Ward, and uh, the counselor, Jake Benson, and the administrator are here, all, Jess Rich, are all here to answer questions. Well, thank you, uh, Representative Murphy. We have Mayor Ward. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. <clears throat> My name is Chad Ward and I'm the Mayor of Proctor. With me today, like Representative Murphy said, is City Councilor Jake Benson and Proctor City Administrator Jess Rich. I appreciate you all hearing me. Mr. Chair, House File 1801 will provide refundable sales tax exemption on material and labor for construction of a new sand and salt storage facility in Proctor. 
Proctor is just 141 miles up I-35 in the gateway to the Northland. It is a community of just over 3,000 residents perched on the rim of Rocky Thompson Hill, overlooking the Great Blue Basin of Lake Superior. For over 100 years, locomotives have pulled their heavy loads of iron ore to Proctor, the largest iron ore sorting yard in the world, downhill to the Duluth ore docks. These ore trains gave Proctor its historic identity as a railroad town. Currently, Proctor Roots have created a community that provides a strong foundation for the future. Before Administrator Rich and Councillor Benson add additional testimony on 1801, I want to encourage your support and to say, Mr. Chair and committee members, on behalf of the city of Proctor, I want to thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ward. You, you had me sold when you mentioned iron ore. So um, next up, we have uh, Mr. Benson. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm Proctor City Councilor Jake Benson. Mr. Chair, committee members, thank you for this opportunity to discuss 1801, and we thank our author, Representative Murphy, for her support. 1801 will save our taxpayers precious money and protect an important waterway, Kingsbury Creek. It's called a creek, but it's much more than that. It's a DNR-designated trout stream, and for a decade, they've planted 1,400 yearling trout a year. Kingsbury Creek flows through Lake Superior Zoo and into the Lake Superior Basin and into water that we, Duluth, Hermantown, and Proctor drink. 1801 will also save our city a lot of money. It represents 1.3% of our $2.8 million budget. Proctor's only one by three miles, but it gets much smaller when you take into account all the land that government owns. Some of the highest valued land in Proctor pays no property taxes because 42.3% of the land is owned by six non-paying tax governments. Proctor's largest property owner, Canadian National Railroad, owns 15.4% of the city and it splits our community in half from corner to corner. 1801, is important for our taxpayers, and it's an essential piece of our public safety projects. It's also a reason why I support House File 2090. And I thank you for your time and attention to this important issue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair and Committee. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Um, member questions? Anyone for the testifier or uh, Representative Murphy on House File 1801? Mr. Chair, I, I would um, like to, you to know that there's a fiscal note. I have received it late last night. I don't know if it got in the packet or not, but it came uh, from the Department of Revenue. And so it is available somewhere if uh, it's the, not in your packets. Yes, the revenue estimate was included in the packet and Thank it has you. been posted online. Thank you very much. Any questions for any of the testifiers or the esteemed uh, Representative Murphy? We, okay, appreci we appreciate your time. Okay. Is that any closing comments or that was it, I, uh, Chair I'm Murphy? Just I'm just proud to put that before you and to have such good testimony. Okay. Thank you, Representative Murphy and Representative Yuakim reanews her motion that House File 1801 be laid over for possible inclusion and the bill is laid over. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Next on the agenda is House File 1329 from Representative Anderson. Can I get a motion to move House File 1329? So moved, Mr. Move, Chair. Mr. Chair. Okay, Sorry. Representative Yuakim moves that House File 1329 be laid over and we have an author's amendment, the A1. Representative Yuakim, would you like to move that as well? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Yuakim uh, moves the A1. Representative Anderson, can you explain what the A1 does? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the A1 is basically corrects a drafting error and it changes the application of the sales tax exemption to an upfront exemption 
instead of what was in the current bill language calling for a pay now and apply later extension for that sales tax exemption. So it uh, puts it in the original language that was in the bill back when it was originally passed, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Any discussion to the amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Those, nay, motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. We have the bill as amended before us, Representative Anderson, to your bill. Thanks again, Mr. Chair and, and committee members. The city of Melrose is back before your committee today asking really for an extension of time to fully utilize the remediation package that was granted by this legislature following a, a pretty devastating fire on the city's main street that took place back in 2016. The site has been since cleaned up and the city has been in negotiations with developers since that time for reconstruction which uh, took place again after the fire, which destroyed about half a city block and caused extensive water damage to the nearby buildings. The city has since uh, gone through a change in city administration, a new administrator, which has slowed down that redevelopment progress somewhat. But the main difficulty, Mr. Chair and members, has been uh, the pandemic, which occurred last year and really uh, kind of ground to a halt any negotiation uh, progress they had made with developers and uh, that's the reason we are back today asking for an extension of time so they can fully utilize the remediation grant and the sales tax extension. And with me today is the administrator of the city of Melrose, Colleen Winter, and she has some uh, testimony for the committee, Mr. Chair. Glad to have her with us today. Well, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, Ms. Winter, welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Is she muted? Miss Winter? Seems like she is not muted, but no one can hear her. Okay, well, well and while she's doing that, uh, we'll go to Mr. Anderson again, you know, or we can go to member questions uh, if you'd like. Mr. Chair, yeah, just a basic explanation. The original legislation granted a $1.4 million remediation package to the city. They've used up uh, over half of that so far with cleanup and other expenses. There's about 640,000 remaining uh, that uh, could be reappropriated uh, from uh, fiscal year 2022 if, if this committee would, would so choose. And then again, the extension of the sales tax would also be the part of this uh, package, Mr. Chair. Okay. We do have a question of Representative Hurtas. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, are you able to hear me okay? I can hear you, yes. Very good, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just some uh, historical context uh, in the Property Tax Committee. Uh, there were a couple of these uh, circumstances that came before the committee back in uh, 16 or 17. Uh, right in that time frame, uh, the fire in Melrose, there was another community in southern Minnesota that suffered a, uh, another consequence of uh, having Main Street uh, largely destroyed. And um, <clears throat> after the mitigation, you know, one of the problems these small towns face is how things have changed dynamically with regard to rebuilding and getting uh, comparable uh, appraisals in terms of the cost to build new uh, versus what uh, comps there are in the area. And so it slows down the re redevelopment process quite significantly. And uh, getting uh, folks to uh, do risk taking in some of these small towns and the high cost of reconstruction, this has been uh, central to some of the struggles that small towns have faced. So uh, I support uh, this extension and I just thought I would offer that additional information just to give it context why the time has uh, gone by and maybe it hasn't been completed. Representative Hurtas, your words um, obviously are, you know, 
they're validated across greater Minnesota. I mean, it's hard to get capital investment in these small communities and it, it is a challenge. Um, we have another question, Representative Zwazinski. Zwazinski. So uh, I just, want, <laughs> just wanted to thank uh, Representative Anderson. He's just been a real advocate for this issue and, and just doing a great job representing the people here in uh, the Capitol. So I just uh, given the, the good representative uh, some positive words and a, and a job well done. Thank you. Yes, he, uh, he is a, he's a gem and a scholar and he cares for his community, no doubt about that. We have another question from Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, um, sorry, Representative Anderson, my, my memory's not always so great sometimes. Remind me again how the fight, what happened with the fire in Melrose, how it started? Well, it took about a half a city block. I'm not sure of the exact cause. I'm not gonna speculate on that, um, but it was a pretty devastating fire on, on the main street in the city. There were businesses down below and apartments up above. And um, there's a big hole right now on main street in Melrose. And again, it has been mentioned, difficult to put a package together with developers. So this certainly will go a long way in uh, enticing a developer with the sales tax exemption and some additional funding for uh, a remediation. So uh, the city is requesting this and uh, it's too bad the administrator, we, we can't hear her shouting from Melrose. Because <laughs> she certainly is in See, favor of this know. package as well. Can you hear me well. now? Yes. Can you yes. hear me now? Okay, sorry. I'm <laughs> sincere, I sincerely apologize uh, for this. Okay. I thought I was Ms. really well prepared and I had everything going, so. Okay. Can you Ms. hear me, sir? Ms. Winter, we can. Welcome to the committee and please introduce yourself for the record and you can proceed. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chair and the rest of the tax committee members. And again, a great uh, thank you to Representative Anderson for once again championing this cause for the city of Melrose. I am Colleen Winter. I am the city administrator for the city of Melrose. Um, I actually recognize several members of this committee as uh, Representative Detmer and other folks have probably seen me testify, be testify before last year when we were talking about a, bond, a bonding bill. So again, thank you for allowing me to come before you. As Representative Anderson indicated, we had a fire in 2016 that took out 11 businesses and several residential apartments above those businesses. And so we needed to look at what are we gonna do moving forward? And we, as he had indicated, there was legislation that was introduced in 2017 um, and you generously gave the city close to $1.4 million as well as a sales tax exemption to be able to get something done in the 400 block. Um, just to put in context, the 400 block, the 400 block actually encompasses not only the half a block of where the buildings were damaged by fire in 2016, but it also encompasses an area that's just north of that, which actually was a home of a craft plant at one time, which ironically was also uh, destroyed by fire in 1989. So when we look at the 400 block, we encompass that area as part of that redevelopment process, because to us it's, um, I wish I had a picture in front of you. It's just, it's a great part of Melrose. It's right on the Sock River. It just really is a very valuable thing for the city to redevelop. As Representative Anderson indicated, we have had some changes in terms of our city uh, turnover. The former administrator had left and then there was a gap by which they didn't have an administrator for a period of time. And I came on board in June of 2019. We also had a, a change in terms of our council itself. So we had some political ter uh, positions turn over as well. Um, when I came in June 2019, I, I will tell you that this became one of my highest priorities. Um, ironically, and Representative Anderson knows this, I don't know what it is about Melrose, but um, six months before this fire had happened, we had an arsonist that had burnt our historical St. Mary's Church. So. Um, we just, we had a run that wasn't very good those, those years. And um, anyway, and so this, this along with um, a couple other projects just became the highest priority that I had. So with the council, we kind of looked at, you know, what makes the most sense. And for a while, they were just looking more at, you know, how do we replace 
what the residents lost, not necessarily the commercial buildings. And through some process and kind of looking at it, we said, how do we entice the developer and what's going to be best for the city long term? And so we've really narrowed down our focus as far as what we would like to see here. And it truly is going to be a mixed use type of development. Um, prior to COVID, as uh, Representative Anderson had indicated, we were in negotiations with um, tenants, uh, government tenants, actually, that would be willing to sign long-term leases, which is very palatable for a developer, because if they have that continuous um, uh, revenue stream coming in, they're more likely to be able to get a project completed. And then we also were in the process of doing a very unique um, residential type of structure on the second floor. And again, that was in partnership with a local business that absolutely needs um, housing for, for folks that are coming into the community. And so we were on a great path with that, but then COVID hit and that kind of put everything to kind of a screeching halt. Um, but that doesn't mean we as a city stopped working on this. We continue to work on this. We went through a couple different developers and we finally got to the point where we signed an exclusionary contract with an extremely reputable commercial developer that I believe will get this project done. If anyone's going to do it, um, it's these folks. They have a lot of experience. They've actually come into communities and worked on very um, projects very similar to this, whether it was from fire or from just lack of care or just the area was devastated. Um, they have done a very good job. And so we feel really good about the development group that we're working with right now. And we also feel that we're going to be able to bring back those folks to the table that we had the discussions with prior to when the pandemic hit us um, in 20. And as thank you, uh, Representative Hurtas, um, as he mentioned, you know, we always say that uh, economic development is a marathon. It's not a sprint. And that's very true when it comes to trying to get development to happen. And so while it's been five years since 2016 or 17, when the original legislation happened, it typically does take that time period to really get things going. I will say that without the funds and the sales tax exemption, it would be pretty hard for us to entice the developer because as good as they are, they still have to look at the bottom line. And we wanna make sure that whatever they're doing is a quality product for the city of Melrose. So the one thing I did tell Representative Anderson, um, I don't know if I should have said this or not, but I, I feel very strongly about this, um, that you know the, we're before this body again for a second amendment, but I don't wanna come back to you guys again. I truly don't. I really want this to be the last time. Um, that we do this. So uh, as my grandpa used to say, uh, we either have to fish or cut bait at this point. And so that's kind of where we're at in this process. And I think, again, if you um, are willing to look at this, it's gonna go a long way in helping us really, really, I believe, finally get this project off the ground. So thank you. And I really apologize for my, for my um, lack of not being able to, you not being able to hear me at the beginning. Oh, this is, that isn't the first time and it won't be the last time. So um, thank you so much for your testimony. We do have uh, another question, Representative Joachim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Ms. Winter. I'm so glad you could join us and um, explain all the work that you've been doing out there. We had two kids that went through U of M Morris. So I've spent time going up 94 past your town uh, quite a few, for quite a few years. Um, my quick question was before you were able to jump on was remind me again what uh, caused the fire? I know I noticed you said the church one was an arsonist, but what? Yeah, what the caused church one was Miss Winters. Arsonist. Miss Winters. Oh, sorry, sorry, sir. Um, You're okay. I think it. You know, I'm not sure if it was ultimately electric or something in one of the buildings, one of the older structures. I don't know if that was ever, quite frankly, concluded. Representative Yuki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Winters. Um, I hope we can do this. It's, this is what we do in Minnesota. We help each other out when we need it. So thank you so much for joining us today. Any other member questions? Closing comments, Representative Anderson? Well, thank you to the chair and the committee members and appreciate that uh, 
spirit of helping each other out. That certainly would be the case here. And uh, it was Medelia, the other city in the southern part of the state that had that fire a couple of years ago. And um, But again, thank you much. Uh, Ms. Winters uh, described the situation very well. I would just, again, ask for your support and say thanks to all of you. Thank you, Representative Anderson. Um, Representative Joachim renews her motion that House File 1329 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion and the bill is laid over. And with that, I will turn over the gavel, virtual gavel, to Representative Joachim. Oh, thank you, Representative Lizagard, uh, Chair Lizagard. I didn't quite hear. Did you trail off and say you turned the gavel over to me? Yeah, yeah, didn't you? Yeah, I'm just talking. <laughs> no, no there. worries. There you thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Representative Lizagard. Uh, next up on the agenda is House File 2120, which is Rep Representative Lizagard's bill. Would you like to move your bill? So moved, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Lizagard. Represent Representative Lizagard moves House File 2120 be laid over for possible inclusion. Um, we have a bill before us. Representative Lizagard, to your bill. Well, thank you, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. Um, House File 2120 increases the commercial industrial market value exclusion from the state general levy to 150,000. The bill also decreases the commercial industrial profile of the state general level so that the property subject to the state general tax are not affected by the decrease in the tax base. Um, this does not make any seasonal residential recreational portion of the state general tax. House file 2120 also ensures that all taxpayers are held harm harmless by reducing the total levy amount by 716990 Nine dollars, ninety dollars, and uh, before we get to the testifiers, obviously we've heard a lot about um, how COVID has really affected um, the whole state of Minnesota, and uh, in so many different ways. But in particular, to the small businesses that have struggled with the closures. And um, I said it the other day that you know everyone knows that my heart is with labor, but I I did learn a long time ago that that if businesses aren't successful, labor doesn't have an opportunity and our communities can't flourish. And that is never more true than now. Um, in greater Minnesota, as you heard from the last bill, that it is very difficult to get any kind of investment in these small uh, communities in greater Minnesota. And what this bill does is helps these businesses that are currently um, owned and operated make it through a very, very difficult time, a time when they need us at a time when we, I believe, can deliver. And so um, I, I really hope that everyone can support this bill. We tried in 2017, I believe it was, and we couldn't get it over the finish line. But um, this is a big deal for these small communities. And uh, with me today, I have uh, the president in, in, of the Laurentian Chamber of Commerce, where I am a proud member of. Um, and as a member, I, I hear the stories. I, I talk to business owners and, and the struggles are real. And uh, this is an action that we can do at a state level. And it may not seem, you know, like it's, it's that much, but it is to them. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the testifier, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Representative Lizelgaard. Mr. Olstrom, please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for allowing me to testify before you today. My name is Eric Holmstrom. I'm the president and CEO of the Laurentian Chamber of Commerce. As Representative Lizagard mentioned, we represent businesses in the Evelyn, Gilbert, Mountain Iron, and Virginia area. Right. And we support House File 2120 because it'll reduce the property tax burden for owners of commercial property. The change of an exemption from 100,000 to 150,000 might not seem like a lot to people in some parts of the state, but it makes a big difference in our area. In areas of the state where we've seen declining population, there's often a corresponding financial stress on business owners turning inactive. This financial stress can reach a point where every dollar matters. One way the state can help these small business owners survive is to reduce their property tax burden. Our Laurentian Chamber of Commerce is doing all we can to help these businesses survive and thrive. In this time of constant change, we're reinventing how we serve our members and monitoring the effectiveness of all our actions. We know that if we can make small changes to how we operate so that each of our actions brings marginally more benefits to our members, it can make a big difference. 
Now, see, this bill isn't going to be a game changer for small business, but it will make a marginal difference to help the small businesses we serve. At a time when business owners are forced to make difficult decisions and account for every dollar of revenue and expense, we need to do all we can to help them. Right now, our local small businesses face pressure from the convenience of online shopping, a COVID-19 based reluctance of some to shop in person and a persistence of unemployment and state restrictions on capacity and operations. This effort's more necessary now than ever. Thank you, Madam Chair, Representative List, regarding committee members for this opportunity to testify before you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Hallstrom. Next up, we have Mr. Smith. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Yeah, hi. Um, good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Sean Smith, and I am the Public Policy Chair for NAOP Minnesota. NAOP is the leading organization for commercial and industrial real estate developers and owners. And in this role, I'm a proud volunteer serving my industry. We really view ourselves as providing part of the infrastructure for businesses in the state. We have long supported the reduction of the state general levy. And to that, I want to thank Rep. Liz Lagarde for authorizing this bill. We support the overall goals of this bill, and we urge the committee to include business property tax relief in your omnibus tax bill. Reducing this fixed cost is one of the easiest ways to help businesses in need right now. I do, however, want to express concern over increasing the exemption amount as a way to provide relief to businesses. Many businesses in the state, if not most, choose to lease rather than own their buildings. There are just efficiencies and synergies created in density with real estate being a finite resource. Increasing this exemption not only picks winners and losers based on the size of a building and the relative location, but it also discriminates against those businesses who choose to lease from buildings that are multi-tenanted and larger in size, which there are very, very many throughout the state. I am providing this testimony, for example, in a 400,000 square foot suburban office park, which has approximately 100 tenants leasing space. That equates to an average size of three to 4,000 square feet per tenant. And to put that into further perspective, that's the size of the everyday quick service restaurant that's being tremendously affected by this COVID. In the vast majority of leased buildings throughout the state, real estate taxes are a separate part of the lease. And this tax bill is a direct pass through to tenants proportionate to their size. A more effective and easier solution would be to simply reduce the overall levy amount, which would have a much greater and equitable impact throughout the entire state. And as many of you know, Minnesota is very unique uh, with our state general levy, and that's not in a good way. Minnesota is one of the few states that taxes real estate at the state level and it is the only lower 48 state that taxes a specific type or class of real property, that being commercial and industrial property to which the state general levy applies to. Even when you eliminate the state general levy, Minnesota's effective tax rate is above the national average. And for those that are interested, um, I'd be happy to provide the in-depth research that actually backs this. So again, I want to thank Rep. List Lagarde and members of this committee for providing this much needed, much needed relief to these businesses. And I urge the committee to consider reducing the overall levy as the most effective way to do that this session. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Um, back next up is Ms. Kadoon. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the community. My name is Beth Gadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank Representative Liz, Liz, Liz Lagarde for bringing forward this bill. We are speaking in favor of House File 2020. Um, we are supportive of House File 2020 as this will help reduce a high fixed cost of doing business in Minnesota and continue the great progress that has been made on a bipartisan basis in the past sessions to reduce the state property tax levy. 
As you heard, even though businesses may have been required to close or had restrictions on their operations from COVID-19, they still had expenses that they were required to pay, including their property tax, and that can be one of their higher fixed costs of doing businesses. Minnesota imposes a higher burden on businesses than many other states and a higher burden than other properties due to the state levy as well as our classification system. Unlike most other businesses that pay just their local property taxes, you know, Minnesota businesses have to pay this tax into the state levy. The state levy adds about 25 to 28% of their total property tax bill, so it's a substantial amount. And also businesses pay, um, have 12% of the market value, but pay 28% of the total property tax. So we do impose a larger burden on our Minnesota businesses than other properties. I just wanna give you a couple statistics to see how Minnesota compares with other states because we have made great progress in this area based on, on past legislative action, but we still have work to do. There's a great 50 state comparison study by the Lincoln Institute and the Minnesota Center for Fiscal Excellence. And what this ranking shows, if we've improved in some areas, um, but like I said, we still have work to do. For example, for a million dollar commercial property in an urban area, we ranked fourth highest in 2014. We ranked 10th highest in 2019. So good progress, um, but still in the top 10. For a million dollar prop commercial property in the rural area, um, we ranked second highest in 2014 and ranked sixth highest today. Um, so like I said, progress, but we still need work. While we're supportive of this bill and the levy reduction, I do wanna highlight a concern that was mentioned by um, Sean Smith as well, which is regarding the market value exclusion, um, as we do believe this does have des desperate, desperate results for small businesses, depending on what type of property they are located in. Many small businesses are located in larger market value properties and it ha would have a higher property tax as they're still paying the state levy, whereas similar building a property that might be in a standalone building would not have that same property tax burden. So um, we, we would, would um, kind of encourage you as you look at these, this proposal to maybe look, just focus on reducing the state levy versus the path of continue to um, exclude the market value. So with that, thank you for your support. Um, and we do um, appreciate Representative Liz Lagarde for bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kadu. And I'm gonna kick it over real quick to Kathy Schill to go over the revenue estimate. Um, and then members, if there's, any, if there's not any other questions, then we'll go to Representative Liz Lagarde for closing comments. Ms. Schill. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Kathy Schill, House Fiscal. Um, just a quick note on the revenue estimate. This impact of increasing the market um, value exclusion from 100,000 to 150,000 would have a $20.1 million impact per year. That first year in the revenue estimate is a six month impact. There are some income tax interactions, but what I wanted to clarify here is that the commercial industrial portion of the levy is right now at 737.09 million. This bill would reduce that levy to 716.99 million. That's Thank it, you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Michelle. Members, any further questions? Seeing none, Representative Liz Lacard, final comments. I think we have uh, Representative Gomez that had a question. I am so sorry, Representative Gomez. I missed your hand. Representative Gomez. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I guess I just wanted to make a comment because of, you know, some of the things that we've heard in the testimony, um, you know, about the about the CI levy in particular. Um, you know, and, and talking kind of about the, the burden that it places maybe on, on a certain variety or certain category of um, property over others. I guess I just like, you know, would point out that this was, um, the CI levy's origins are in the Minnesota Miracle um, because of the, the, the way that, um, you know, there was sort of disparities in the ways that education was funded across the state of Minnesota. And so this was, you know, um, <clears throat> a replacement for this, the, the education levy that used to exist. And, um, you know, I just think that it's really important when we're talking about our relative kind of tax competitiveness that we take a look at the entire picture, which is that 
Minnesota is a great place to do business. And part of the reason that it's such a great place to do business, and we have a number of Fortune 500 companies, and it is consistently rated, um, you know, a good place to live, a good place to raise kids, a good place to have a family, and a good place to do business. And the reason that we do not see the kind of tax flight that we get so much alarmism about in this committee is because we invest in our communities, we invest in our schools, we invest in our infrastructure, we invest in our people. And so I, it, it, is, it is a false choice to say that, you know, <clears throat> we are either a competitive state or, or a high tax state. You know, um, I guess I just, I just think that it's, I think it's really important when, when we hear from, you know, from our, when we hear so much about how the sky is falling because of the tax burden on people in our state that, we just we just don't see the tax flight, and we just consistently see that this is a good place to live and a good place to do business. Um, you know, the, the other piece actually is that I, I think that you know, Mr. Smith and Ms. Kadoon kind of referred to this a little bit, but you know, what I would say is that um, in my community, uh, the businesses that were most impacted by COVID, the businesses that are struggling the most, do not own their commercial spaces. Um, and so this is sort of a similar issue to when we talk about cutting, um, you know, property taxes in any in any uh, kind of space. Is that sort of something that's passed on to the to the renter, um, whether it's a commercial renter or a residential renter? And so for me, like in the situation where we're where we're doing, you know, what's a, a I mean, it's not a huge tax cut, but it's a significant tax cut to those people who actually own buildings is like, how is that supposed to trickle down to, to, the, to the little business that's, that's renting a spot that's really been impacted by COVID that's been keeping up with their rent? So I just wanted to put that out there as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Gomez. Um, one more question, Representative Sandel. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and um, Representative Lisa Garrett, I uh, always enjoy hearing bills that you present. Um, but I do have a question, I think, for uh, Ms. Kadoon. You mentioned uh, that uh, the uh, the bill that we're talking about would increase the exemption of uh, CI property from 100000 to 150000 Now, presumably, that would uh, help small businesses. But I wonder what percentage of those small businesses have property values between 100 and 150 thousand dollars. That is under 150 thousand dollars. And what percentage of those businesses that that uh, this bill would affect have um, significant value over 150 thousand I dollars? Mean, you can tell that I'm interested in in the in the small business owners. Ms. Kadoon or Representative Lagarde. Ms. Kadoon. Yeah, Madam Chair of Representative, um, I really do not have the data. I think that might be a better question for nonpartisan staff on what percent of businesses. Um, my comments were more, more related. There's a lot of small businesses that are tenants in larger properties. So that's the concern when I mentioned when you start excluding a portion of the market value, you're going to have that des you know different impacts depending on where the business is located. Sure. And I'd also say you tend to have higher market values in the metro area versus the rural area. So then once again, you're going to see if you um, continue this path that the state levy portion will tend to be just falling more on metro businesses. Um, so, like I said, nonpartisan staff maybe has the, the data that you're looking for. Representative Sandel, would you like to follow up with nonpartisan staff offline? Is that okay? Uh, just one, just one, just one uh, comment, uh, okay. uh, Chair, and that is, uh, uh, I, I I agree with you, Ms. Kadoon, that small businesses are really the backbone of of, uh, of our economy and and. Uh, uh, I think the world of them in, in my community as well. I just want, I, I, I want to support um, Representative Lissigard's bill, but I also want to make sure that we're protecting small businesses, small property owners, rather than uh, giving this tax break to people who are, uh, um, who represent much larger and uh, um, uh, bigger business. Thank you uh, for your time, uh, uh, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Representative Lissigard. Thank you, Representative Sindel. And uh, uh, we're the metro area in Hopkins and St. Louis Park, and we have a lot of small business owners that own businesses under 150,000. So thank you, Representative Liz Lagarde, for bringing forward this bill and final comments. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and then committee members. I'm gonna digress a little bit because um, some of what Representative Gomez said 
really hit me. And we as a state um, really have to have a conversation moving forward. And we know where the, the small businesses across the state, they are the backbone. But the, the true economic engine of this state is these big corporations that are down here. And when we start to see Target, when, um, when we start to see these individuals working from home, it's it, it, what scares me about that is if the small businesses that are in or around these massive hubs, there's not going to be individuals coming down there and spending money. They're going to be working from home. Furthermore, and when you have clients, your clients aren't coming down and they're not spending money. So not only are you losing the, the tax base of these buildings, you're also losing the people that go down there and they shop and support these small businesses. So this is a, this is a, to me, this is a critical moment for us to support the small businesses where we can. But more globally, we have to start looking about what is this after this pandemic? What are things going to look like in two or three or four years when everybody figures out how to do Zoom? When everybody, and it just becomes more natural so people aren't going in. They're working from home. So I think we have a challenge. We need to be, be forward thinking in the coming years because I think that it is going to affect our bottom line is revenue generated with the state of Minnesota. So with that little um, off trail, I, I hear you, Representative Gomez. I understand your, your passion. It's real. But um, we definitely have to support our small businesses because they need to be successful because they are the backbone of, of, of our state. So with that, I appreciate all the support. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Luz Lagarde. Representative Luz Lagarde renews his motion that House File 2120 be laid over for possible inclusion. The bill's laid over, and with that, I will be turning the gavel back to uh, Chair Mark Ward. Well, thank you very much, Chair Joachim, for um, chairing the meeting, and Representative Les Lagarde for starting it off today. Um, thank you very much. The next bill on the agenda is House File 6, Representative Knorr and um, uh, the Promise Act established. And so members, um, we're going to get to vote. First vote of the year, I think, in tax committee. So we need a motion to re-refer this bill uh, to the Committee on Ways and Means. Who would like to offer that motion? So moved. Representative Gomez. Representative Gomez. Uh, moves House File 6 to be re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Thank you very much. Representative Knorr, welcome to the committee. And uh, what we are talking about is in um, Article 3, there are some uh, tax provisions. So, and I know you also have an amendment, so we will do that. Uh, there's actually a total of three amendments uh, that we'll be considering, but we're gonna do your author amendment first. And then we'll go to testifiers uh, and so forth. And then we'll come back uh, to the other amendments. So Representative uh, Knorr, uh, would you like someone to move your A1 amendment? Yes, please, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative uh, Gomez moves the A1 amendment. Uh, Representative Knorr, would you tell us what that amendment does? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, this is a technical amendment uh, because this bill is a bill that we drafted last year and there were some few changes to update the bill so that it's in a shape uh, and form that I can present to this committee today. Very good. Any questions for Representative Noor? If not, we're gonna vote on the A1 amendment. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those aye. opposed say nay. Uh, the motion does prevail. The A1 amendment is adopted. Uh, Representative Noor, to your bill, House File 6. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. As you all recall, last year when we had the civil unrest, over 1,500 businesses were damaged and some of them were completely destroyed. As I go through in my district, or Representative Gomez district and others, I still see the damages, the rubbles on the ground, and many businesses who are struggling, not only with the pandemic, but the struggle to rebuild, not to rebuild the, the way they were, but even in a better shape. Members, this is about appealing to the state to make sure that we are able to support small businesses 
who have been the backbone, the engine, as you've had from previous uh, discussions today. Without a small businesses, we don't have a business economy. We're talking about the commercial corridors for the city of Minneapolis along the Lake Street, on Broadway or in St. Paul, on the Midway, along the University Avenue. Those are the fabric and the cultural and commercial corridors for our cities. They're the economic engine for our state. Members under the Article 3, uh, this section provides sales tax exemption and property tax relief for properties and business that were destroyed or damaged during the civil unrest in the cities that were included in the peacetime emergency declared by the governor under the Executive Order 20-64. This is under the providing resource opportunity and maximizing investments in striving entrepreneurs, or otherwise known as the Promise Act. This will provide sales tax exemption for construction materials, supplies, some of the rebuilding uh, materials that are needed, including to the contractors and subcontractors. So this is more of a holistic approach. It also includes replacement of capital equipment, and cleaning and disinfecting some of the buildings from the smoke damage and also graffiti, which you can see along those uh, corridors. This will cover small businesses with an annual gross income as defined in the bill. It also includes the nonprofits or a qualifying low income housing development. Members, this bill will not cover if, a, if somebody purchases the, the building it does not cover the new owner because they bought that building as is. The, exempt the exemptions cover purchases made from May 25, 2020 and before December 1, 2022. It's a short period of time. It's a reimbursable uh, sales tax exemption. Members under the other section of the property tax relief for property damage uh, by fire and vand vandalism includes uh, tax abatements for five years uh, and also valuation freeze of the property. This relief will be available to properties located in the areas that I just defined under the Executive Order 20-64, which have sustained the damage more than, uh, more than 25%. Mr. So, Chen, members, um, you can go along these corridors, even right now across the street from my building, or on Lake Street, or on, on the corridors that I just described, and you'll see it for yourself. This is a long overdue support that they have asked. The business have been before us multiple times. I appreciate many of you coming along to see the damages during the civil unrest. It's time for us now to act so that we can rebuild, reinvest, and reimagine a corridor that will be better than how it was before. With that, Mr. Chair, I do have individuals who have signed up to testify. And also, if there are any questions, the nonpartisan staff are ready to respond to those questions. So thank you so much. Very good. So let's go to testifiers, if that's all right, Representative Noor. And um, first up, we have Rebecca Malmquist, Minneapolis City Assessor. Good afternoon. Very good. Welcome to the committee and please identify yourself. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Marquardt and committee members. My name is Rebecca Malmquist. I am the interim city assessor for the city of Minneapolis. Thank you to the thank you to Chair Noor for authoring House File 6, the Promise Act, and to the committee for providing the opportunity to speak with you today regarding the proposed property tax provisions in House File 6 that will provide additional relief to property owners who were affected by the unrest last year. In accordance with current state statute 273.1232, last summer following the unrest, our team was charged with the task of reassessing all properties that were damaged to determine the amount of damage. This involved the review of approximately 900 properties to quantify the amount of structural damage. Through community outreach and leveraging technology to complete the reassessment during the instability, coupled with COVID-19 concerns, 
we were able to connect and work with property owners to collect documentation and provide guidance on the disaster reassessment and the abatement process. We were also able to direct them to other city resources. Statute 273.1233 establishes a threshold of 50% or more damage to qualify for tax abatement. There were 75 properties that sustained 50% or more damage. There were 70 properties that applied for and received a tax abatement. The tax abatement was calculated using the original January 2nd, 2020 estimated market value less the reassessed value. The city assessor's office made application seeking reimbursement from the state last fall through the governor and the executive committee. The reimbursement was granted and Hennepin County, the city of Minneapolis and the other taxing authorities were reimbursed just over $1.6 million. The legislation in House File 6 reduces the threshold from 50% to 25%. Lowering this threshold will provide relief to approximately 20 more properties. Also provided in the proposed language is a freeze or a limit to the property's estimated market value. The values would be frozen at the 2020 reassessed value after the damage reassessment. The values would be frozen until January 1st, 2025 assessment for taxes payable in 2026. Again, thank you to Chair Noor for authoring this comprehensive and needed legislation to provide additional relief to properties impacted during the civil unrest. Thank you, Chair Marquardt and committee members for hearing this bill today and allowing me to speak with you. This concludes my remarks and I'm happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Malmquist. And we'll take the next testifier and then we, if folks have any questions for the testifiers at that point, so if you could stick around. Uh, next, we have Derek Hodge. Uh, Mr. Hodge, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself and begin your testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and committee, after, uh, committee members, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Derek Hodge. I work for Hennepin County in the Resident and Real Estate Services Department, which operates within the statutory authority of the County Auditor Treasurer Statutes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of this important legislation. We greatly appreciate Representative Noor and Representative Gomez's leadership and the, this committee's work to help the businesses, nonprofits, and residents across Hennepin County and the Metro rebuild. Current law provides property tax abatements and credits for a property seriously damaged or destroyed by arson or vandalism. If a property's damage is at least 50% of the building's value, the property is eligible for an abatement in the year the damage occurred and a credit the following year. The role of my office in this process is to calculate the disaster abatements and credits after the local assessor, in this case, the city of Minneapolis, submits to us eligible properties that have also made appropriate application. We worked with the city last summer and fall to get these abatements applied to properties as quickly as possible and when appropriate, refund any overpaid tax amounts. My experience is talking to impacted property owners, probably about 35 or so, demonstrated immense gratitude for whatever relief was available. However, probably a third of those I talked to did not qualify under the current law. The scale of devastation from last summer's unrest requires a more robust and expedited, expedited response than current law provides. Working with the city of Minneapolis, we processed over $1.6 million in abatements for 70 properties that qualified under the current law. This legislation would increase the benefit for properties eligible under current law, expand the benefit to more impacted properties, and help all eligible properties into the future by freezing their valuation until 2025. This legislation will provide certainty to affected property owners and businesses that property taxes will not impede their ability to rebuild, and so they will be able to use the money to invest in their business. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to testify, and I'm also available for questions. Thank you very much. Uh, very much, Mr. Hodge. Uh, before we go to questions, uh, from the revenue uh, note here, uh, revenue estimate, on the sales tax exemption part, the total cost in 22 and 23 is $3.58 million with no cost into the tails. And uh, regarding the property tax and the, uh, the tax, the disaster property tax credit, uh, the cost would be uh, net 340000 in 21, 
uh, and 22 total, 340,000, and a total of 160,000 in 24 and 25. So any questions from members? Well, first of all, anyone else uh, on the Zoom that would like to speak uh, in regards to house file number six? If not, uh, members, any questions for the author of the bill or the testifiers before we would move to amendments? Uh, Representative McDonald. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Question for the author, Representative Moore. Uh, see, in regards to the, the uh, some of the funds going to the nonprofit groups, I'm just curious. I did a, just a quick search on uh, some donations because Minnesotans are very generous, as you know, and in times of tragedy, we step up to the plate. And uh, I just did a search on some of the donations that were uh, donated to the nonprofits groups in Minneapolis and St. Paul. And Representative found, McDonald, uh, what portion uh, of the bill are you referring to? Uh, let's see the portion. Do you want a, a statute, uh, the uh, subsection well, number? Is, are you on Article 3? Representative McDonald? You know what, I'm going to, I'll have to look. I have it pulled up on a couple of different computers. Why don't I uh, pause my question and get the uh, information handy and then come back? Thank you. We will make sure you have that opportunity. Uh, Representative Detmer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, could the author, I find it in the bill several times, it talks about civil unrest. Could you define the term civil unrest? Representative Nor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, I think we, we can all define the civil unrest, uh, the incidents that took place after the murder of George Floyd in the city of Minneapolis. Uh, following that civil unrest, you saw the public outrage. Uh, you saw what happened to our cities. Uh, those are things I think I can personally define, but I'll ask the, uh, the nonpartisan staff if, uh, to see if there's a definition in the statute of what civil unrest is. So, it, uh, Mr. Swanson, are you... Are you um... Would you please proceed with that if a uh, definition of civil unrest? Uh, Mr. Chair and, and members, there is not a definition of civil unrest within the bill language. Uh, Representative Detmer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, you know, being that term has been used a lot. I think there should be a definition there. Um, would you, would the author say that in this case, would civil unrest be more like, uh, uh, I don't know if it's more like protest or rioting, because what what occurred during that time of, with the destruction of the businesses, I would term it not just civil unrest; it would be rioting. Would the, would the author agree there? Well, and I'm going to call on Representative Nor, but uh, when we heard these other bills that deal with disaster aid, we don't necessarily pertain to what the reason was. I mean, typically we're helping businesses and cities where through no fault of their own, these businesses were destroyed and now you're doing something in that regard. So I go ahead, Representative Nor, but um, I, I don't know if you have to get into the definition of civil unrest at this point. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Chan. I think uh, we can even call it civil disobedience. And I think that is more... Uh, the languages that are used in insurance industry to describe some of the situations, what is a riot, what is civil uh, disobedience and whatnot. So I didn't want to go into the terminologies and I hope uh, the definition based on the insurance uh, uh, will help us and guide us because we're talking about properties that were damaged or destroyed no during the civil Just unrest. Oh, no, I had it. Oh, thank you, Mr. Oh, Chair. Mr. Someone... Chair, I just said a lot of times pieces of legislation that comes forward do have definitions for terms that are that are used. That's that was my simple question. Thank Very you. good. Thank you, Representative Detmer. Um, we're going to come back to Representative McDonald since I had uh, deferred him. Representative McDonald. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess in looking here in uh, subsection two 
The establishment directs the Commission of Employment and Economic Development to create programs to grants to eligible organizations and to nonprofits. So the question I have to Representative North. So Representative McDonald, is that Article 3? I believe it is. Article 2. I mean, I do uh, really two, want to stay two. on the tax provisions of the bill. I'll grant you a little leeway, but I want to really stay to Article 3, which okay. is the tax provisions of the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, then let me just say this. I do- Representative McDonald. Representative Knorr. Rep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Knorr, I support the uh, portion of the bill that it offers tax exemptions for rebuilding material. Great. And freezing the property levy. Great. Definitely for these business owners. My questioning, Mr. Chairman, if you allow me, is the portion of the funding that will go for nonprofits, which they do good work, but in- searching on the amount of donations donated in 2020 to nonprofits from the Minneapolis, uh, from Lake Street Council, uh, nonprofit group to the Midway United Fund, to the West Broadway Business Area Coalition, uh, millions of dollars, seven, over $7 million donated. So I'm just wondering on these nonprofits groups in your bill, uh, have you done any research and uh, investigated what kind of where their funding has gone so far in the rebuilding and how has it gotten right to the people? Representative McDonald, I let you finish the question, but that's not pertinent uh, to the provisions we're going through in this bill. Representative yeah. Gold, do you have anything further, Representative McDonald? Okay, Representative Gomez. I have nothing further to add. <laughs> Thank you very much, Representative myself. McDonald. Thank Thank you, Representative Mr. Gomez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I, just if it's helpful to Representative Detmer, I mean, we did, um, you know, there's not in the in the definition section at the front of the bill, we don't define civil unrest, but in Article 3, as we get into the tax provisions, lines 5.15 to 5.19 do really define um, what is in and out of scope um, in in terms of the, the relief that we're trying to provide to businesses that were damaged. So I, I hope that that clarifies what we're trying to do here. I think that, you know, um, I think unfortunately, you know, we've seen a lot of um, unnecessary politicization of this issue and, you know, a kind of some people really wanting to get into whether we call some, you know, what name we call something really tragic that happened in my community and, and something really tragic that happened um, to our to our business community and to the, to the economic kind of driver of the communities that I represent. And it doesn't really matter to them what we call it. Um, what matters is that, you know, through no fault of their own, they sustained really major damage and large parts of our community are literally still in piles of rubble. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to do. That's who we're trying to help. And I hope that those few lines there help define the scope of what we were trying to do with this bill. Thank you very much. And, you know, this is one of the first bills, I guess, you know, the cigarette um, transfer was another one sort of that. It's a bigger bill that has, you know, tax provisions in it. And the reason we've got to put some guardrails on that is that later on, we're going to be hearing a lot of bills coming through here, omnibus bills, education bill, Health and Human Service Bill, and they're going to have tax provisions, and that's why they will be in the bill. And so what we will not do is discuss the education finance bill. We'll discuss the tax proportions of it. We won't discuss the Health and Human Service Bill. So that's why this committee has to deal with taxes. And most of the bills we've had up to this point this year is just a tax provision. And so there's certainly leeway, uh, you know, to give backgrounds on bills. But if, if I open it up today to referring to other sections and other parts of this bill that just really are totally unrelated, uh, that just really isn't a proper use of the time here in the Taxes Committee. So, rep um, rep and Representative Detmer. And thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and uh, Representative Gomez, thank you for your comments. You know, it's, I think we ought to understand that. Uh, uh, there was a lot of destruction going on during that time period. But uh, thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. 
Uh, Representative Knorr, before we move to uh, amendments, do you have any kind of comments on any of the conversation or testimony that's occurred up to this point? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, thank you. Very good. So we do have, and I don't know who's offering, we have an A2 and an A3 amendment. I don't know which one wants to be offered first or who wants to offer that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Pat Garofalo. I'll, I'll move the A2 amendment. Representative Garofalo moves the A2 amendment. Please explain the A2 amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members. Uh, as members of the committee know, uh, there's been limited opportunities for us to move tax bills. There's a tax bill moving out of this committee today, and it's something that I believe every member of this committee, in fact, every member of the legislature supports, and that is that it conforms us to the federal government for unemployed compensation for those people who lost their jobs last year. This provides $269 million of tax relief. Every single penny goes to people who lost their jobs. Uh, it conforms to the federal government, has a cap of adju adjusted gross income of 150000 I would ask for members' support and ask for a unanimous roll call on this uh, amendment. Roll call has been asked for. Are there 15? Oh, yeah, that's right. We don't have <laughs> uh, uh, Representative Knorr, any comments to that or any other discussion on this amendment? And I will say, uh, but there isn't much for germaneness as far as rules. So we're going to let this go, of course, but this is... Uh, broadening the scope just a little bit of Article 3 of this bill, but I'm going to allow it. So, uh, Representative Knorr, a yes or a no on what you'd like to see? Well, I, I appreciate that. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Chair and Representative Greffel. As you're aware of, this is a separate uh, discussion, uh, but I think there's a more broad-based conversation on the uh, unemployment uh, tax deduction. And I think uh, we will have that discussion in the coming days. I appreciate uh, that it's a separate conversation and to allow us to actually take a deep dive into the unemployment and the PPP uh, conversation separately. So it's a no for me at this moment. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative, Representative Noor, Garofalo. Just to be clear, Representative Noor, this is just the unemployment deduction. This is just, this is just for people who lost their jobs last year. There's no PPP in this amendment. It is just for unemployed individuals. There is there's nothing that needs to be studied. If there is if there's anyone, any member of this committee who has a concern with protect give, putting keeping money in the pockets of unemployed individuals, please raise your hand. I'm not aware of anyone who is opposed to this language at all. Is there anyone on the committee? Uh, Representative Noor, anyone who has a question or concern about this language, because I, my understanding is that there is unanimous agreement about us conforming with the federal government and protecting, keeping money in the pockets of those who lost their jobs last year. Is there anyone? So, um, members, uh, anything further, Representative Garofalo? Uh, I just, I don't, I'm not aware of any okay. member of this committee who's opposed to this. And well, Representative Noor said we need to do a deeper okay. dive on it. I'd like to know what that issue is on a deeper dive. So. Mr. Chair. Thank you. Well, go ahead, Representative Knorr. Uh, Representative Graffel, I think there's a, there's a bill that was authored by uh, Chair Stevenson, who is leading on this effort. So that's a whole bill that is ready to go. And I think uh, I'm assuming this that bill will be coming to you in this uh, committee to discuss more about the deductions. Uh, in, in, in the next, uh, I don't know when, but the chair will determine that when that is coming to the uh, to the committee. So, so, Mr. Chair, in closing, if I, could, if I could make my closing comment, Representative Noor, that's the problem, is when the bill came up, it was laid over. It was not, we were not scheduled for a vote. We were not allowed to progress on it. And the concern that increasing members of both sides of the aisle have is that this assistance is being going to be delayed and waited for the omnibus tax bill. And people are paying higher taxes right now. I had a uh, two-parent uh, two family in my district. I got emailed on two days ago. They had to write a check to the state of Minnesota for $965 because they both had the misfortune of losing their jobs last year. That's a real life concern that needs to be addressed now. Representative Noor, that's why I'm offering the bill. I would hope that members on the other side of the aisle recognize uh, the importance of this and vote yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, members, let me be clear. A top priority of this tax committee in the House of Representatives is going to be providing this tax conformity to those folks who received unemployment 
uh, insurance uh, benefits. I mean, we've already heard that bill. Representative Stevenson has heard the bill. We have it there. And um, we're not only going to just be helping those folks, but we know that the lower your income was heading into the pandemic, uh, the harder you've been hit uh, by COVID-19. In fact, 57% of all UI recipients represent the bottom 40% of our income levels. And at the very height uh, of the unemployment insurance, there were up to 500,000 claimants. And that was in April of 2020, who either were ongoing or receiving the pandemic unemployment assistance, 500,000. We still, in January, have 133,000. So uh, what I can say very clear is that conformity will be provided at least to the level that the, the federal government is providing at $10,200. And that will come out of this tax committee and that will come out of the House of Representatives and hopefully everyone will support it at that time. Now, yesterday, as I have alluded to, the Internal Revenue Service uh, verified late yesterday afternoon that they are delaying uh, the filing of taxes to May 17th, which by the way, just happens to be the last day of session. Um, typically, and I would strongly presume, and I think we're gonna get an announcement tomorrow, the Minnesota Department of Revenue follows suit. And so members, we not only can take care of this problem, on unemployment insurance and make sure that these families and these workers who have lost their jobs are gonna be hit with you know, this unexpected tax bill, we're gonna take care of that, at least as far as the federal government conforms. But besides that in our tax bill, we're gonna be dealing with uh, how to also help families and workers and businesses um, not only recover, but be stronger than that. And we're looking at our tax bill uh, coming out the first week of April. So uh, if there's apprehension right now among folks, uh, it won't be on the House. It won't be out of this tax committee because we're gonna produce a bill that provides for unemployment insurance conformity. And on top of that, we're gonna help uh, as many folks as we can, small businesses, families, and workers that have been hit uh, by COVID-19. So members, I would ask you to vote no, and Ms. Griska, if you could take the roll. Mark Horton. No. Le Mark Horton, no. Liz Lagarde. No. Liz Lagarde, no. Davids. Davids, yes. Davids, yes. Abaje. No. Abaje, no. Carlson. Carlson, no. Carlson, no. Detmer. Detmer, aye. Detmer, yes. Garofalo. Garofalo, yes. Garofalo, yes. Gomez. Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Her. Her. Hurtas. Y-E-S. Hurtas, yes. Howard. No. Howard, no. McDonald. McDonald, yes. McDonald, yes. Miller. Miller, pass. Miller, pass. Moran. No. Moran, no. Mortensen. Aye. Mortensen, aye. Robbins. Aye. Robbins, aye. Sundell. No. Sundell, no. Schultz. No. Schultz, no. Stevenson. No. Stevenson, no. Swazinski. Yep. Swazinski, yes. Joachim. Joachim, no. Joachim, no. Her. Her, no. Her, no. Miller. Miller's path.
There are eight yes, 12 no, and one abstain. Thank you, Ms. Griska. So there being eight ayes and 12 nays, the A2 amendment does not prevail. The A2 amendment, the motion does not prevail. The A2 amendment is not adopted. Representative Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move the A3 amendment. And before I do that, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, in your comments, I listened to them very carefully. I noticed that you used the singular of the word tax bill. Uh, you did not use plural. Um, does that mean that the passage of the unemployment insurance in income will be tied to other tax provisions? Thank you, Representative Graffalo. What that means is I have control over producing at least one tax bill. Uh, leadership would have to determine another one. Okay, so, um, well, whoever's listening, whether it's you or leadership or whoever's on this call, the notion that we're going to uh, take hostages with unemployment insurance and the PPP loans. There's bipartisan support for this. They're not going to get any amendments from our side of the aisle. I don't. So th th that is the first time that I have heard you acknowledge the singular that there's going to be one tax bill. And so that's to whoever's calling the shots on that one. Uh, in addition to it being wrong, it's political suicide. I mean, the DFL is literally metaphorically taking out a gun and shooting themselves in the foot. But we'll save that for a conversation for another time. Um, the, the the A3 amendment, uh, Mr. Chairman and members, is uh, does what every state around us does, and that is that we don't tax the PPP loans. Uh, again, I am not aware of any outside group, individual, specific legislator who thinks that we should be taxing the PPP loans, which was disaster assistance given to businesses to help them out. I'm not aware of any entity that's in favor uh, of taxing that. So what this bill does is it allows us to pass it, to get this stuff done, to not make it a condition, uh, uh, to, to not have a tax increase be tied at it to, as a condition. Uh, it's the right thing to do. I would ask for a roll call and ask for member support. Thank you. Representative Garofalo moves the A3 amendment A3 and A3 asks A3 for a roll A3 call. From his uh, members, uh, Representative Howard. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Garofalo asked if any of us had concerns with these amendments, so I thought I'd oblige him. Uh, the reality is uh, something that, well, what has been the case for decades is what Representative uh, McDonald said, in times of tragedy, in tragedy, we step up to the plate. We don't uh, attach other provisions when Minnesotans are struggling and in need. Um, and I, I hear the, the urgency on some of these issues, I'll tell you, it would be nice to see some urgency to support our communities in Minneapolis. It is a shame that we have not passed the Promise Act yet. You know, uh, last session, we gave $50 million to support our dairy farmers in need. Our Minneapolis members didn't band together and say, you know what, hey, we can stop this. We could just say no. Um, our communities have been underinvested for decades, so we're going to vote against this. Uh, they did not do that. Our, we stood together as Minnesotas and, and helped folks in need. When we had fires in Melrose or Medelia, Minneapolis members didn't say, we're, we're bigger. Where's ours? Uh, no, uh, Minnesotans, Democrats and Republicans stood together and stood by each other and helped each other. Um, for decades, whether it's floods in Southwest Minnesota, whether it's fires in Wadena, we have stood together arm to arm to help Minnesotans when need. Until now, apparently, until now. For months, this uh, Promise Act, we have not seen the urgency on a bipartisan basis to help Minnesotans in needs. And what's the difference? Why are we not supporting our black and brown business owners in Minneapolis that were hurt uh, so mightily uh, during the social unrest? It's just shameful. And so, members, if we really want to put our money where our mouth is and help Minnesotans at a time of tragedy, and step up to the plate to do so, let's pass the Promise Act. Let's not attach other elements of legislation and use our Minneapolis businesses that have been struggling as a political prop, which is, I believe, what this amendment does. It's a shame we haven't passed this bill yet, and this amendment's a sham, so I'd encourage a no vote. Representative Mortensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I see a lot of urgency. Uh, I hear the people of Minnesota crying for urgency. Um, I, I hear the urgency out of Representative Howard. But for the public, I think that are watching this, um, before the 
meeting today, I went back and I looked at all the minutes of all the meetings we've had. And I think it's important and very telling to see that today is our 20th meeting over the last two and a half months. And we have yet to vote on a single bill in any of these 20 meetings. I was so excited as a freshman to be on this tax committee and to be able to cast these votes and help decide what bills continue along the process. But for 20 meetings now, every single bill gets tossed into the omnibus bill. So if you guys are serious about urgency, we would stop this practice of putting everything in omnibus bills that won't even get heard for yet another two months. There's no urgency being shown. So I would urge people that we should be actually passing bills individually through committee and putting them on the floor uh, and allowing debates to take place. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We're gonna to move to the vote and members, I would ask for a no vote. Uh, this bill does not uh, bring along all of our businesses that are hurting during the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to do that. So Ms. Griska, please take the vote. Marcourt. No. Marcourt, no. Liz Lagarde. No. Liz Lagarde, no. Davids? Davids, yes. Davids, yes. Bajay? No. Bajay, no. Carlson? Carlson, no. Carlson, no. Detmer? Detmer, aye. Detmer, aye. Garofalo? Garofalo, aye. Garofalo, aye. Gomez? Gomez, no. Gomez, no. Her? Her, no. Her, no. Hurtas? Yes. Hurtas, yes. Howard? No. Howard, no. McDonald? McDonald, yes. McDonald, yes. Miller? Pass. Moran? Moran, no. Moran, no. Mortensen? Aye. Mortensen, aye. Robbins? Aye. Robbins, aye. Sandell? No. Sandell, no. Schultz? No. Schultz, no. Stevenson? No. Stevenson, no. Swazinski? Yes. Swazinski, yes. Joachim? No. Joachim, no. Eight eyes, 12 nays, and one pass. Uh, there being eight eyes and 12 nays, the A3, uh, the A3 amendment is, uh, the motion does not approve, the A3 amendment is not adopted. So members, we're gonna take a vote at 228, but Chair Davids, you're next. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. A few comments. Uh, it was somewhat comical when a member of this committee was talking about the tremendous urgency of this bill when the DFL didn't bring it up on day one if it's urgent. Why are we, what's the, I'm looking at my new watch. It is the 18th of March, and all of a sudden it's urgent. Amazing. Uh, I, I'm, I am a bit confused here and not about the issue. I'm not talking issue. I'm talking about process, not policy. We're going to be going to the floor with a tax bill that is not agreed to. On the PPP issue and the unemployment issues, Republicans repeatedly said, we would stand down. We will stand down and we will let this get through. We are enter entering into a very dangerous premise here. If we're going to be taking a tax bill to the floor without agreement. And I go, again, don't tell me about urgency on this, please don't tell me about urgency. There is no urgency on this because we could have done this day one and we didn't do it. Um, my good friend, Chair Mark Court, you said the other day that we can't let the train leave the station without having everyone on board. Well, officially, we are not on board on this. And talking about this being a top priority, we're moving a Minneapolis bailout before we take care of unemployment for the working poor in the middle class before we do PPP loans for small business. So we're headed in a very, very dangerous direction here, taking a tax bill to the House floor. And to Representative Martinson, the issue is you don't want a whole bunch of tax bills on the House floor. 
You Chair don't want to tax Chair on the House floor. Chair Davids, we need to go to a vote. You're talking more about not the tax policy in this bill. So we need to move to a vote. And 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 thank you, Mr. Chair. The tax I'll I'll directly talk about the tax policy. It's okay, no, we need to move to the vote. Unwise Members move. we're moving to a vote. Please take the roll, Ms. Griska. The motion is uh, from Representative Gomez to uh, re-refer House File 6 as amended to the Committee on Ways and Means. Ms. Griska, please take the roll. Markhart. Aye. Markhart, aye. Liz Lagarde. Aye. Liz Lagarde, aye. Davids? Davids, no. Davids, no. Abaje? Aye. Abaje, aye. Carlson? Carlson, aye. Carlson, aye. Detmer? Nay. Detmer, nay. Garofalo? Garofalo, no. Garofalo, no. Gomez? Gomez, aye. Gomez, aye. Her? Her, aye. Her, aye. Her, toss. Her toss. Go ahead. Howard. Howard. Aye. Howard, aye. McDonald. McDonald, no. McDonald, no. Miller. Miller, no. Miller, no. Moran. Yes. Moran, yes. Mortensen. Mortensen. Robbins. No. Robbins, no. Sandell. Yes. Sandell, yes. Schultz. Yes. Schultz, yes. Stevenson. Yes. Stevenson, yes. Swazinski. No. Swazinski, no. Joachim. Yes. Joachim, yes. Hurtas. My fault. Okay. Martinson. Okay. We have 12 eyes, seven no's. There being 12 ayes and seven no's, the motion does prevail. House file six, as amended, is re-referred to the Committee on Ways and Means. Members, thank you for your work uh, this week. Uh, we are adjourned.